Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, December 12th, 2023. Good to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, our members have provided the foundation for everything we do, from proceedings and naval history to Naval Institute press books to events and conferences Members receive Proceedings Magazine, print and digital, or digital only, and big discounts on Naval Institute press books and invitations to member-only events. To become a member of the Institute, go to usni.org forward slash join and use the code HOLLY23 to get $10 off membership uh, this week, this month, and even into early, uh, no, uh, early January of 2024. All right, now let's get to the guest. Uh, Navy Commander Jeff Vandenegel uh, is joining me today from his home in Alexandria, Virginia. Jeff is the author of a new book from the Naval Institute Press titled Questioning the Carrier, Opportunities in Fleet Design for the U.S. Navy. Jeff is also a frequent contributor to Proceedings and the winner of several of our essay contests over the past few years. Jeff, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me, Bill. Uh, so for those who are interested in going back to Jeff's previous uh, appearance on the show, it was December 2019. It was episode 122. And we were talking then about your essay that won the CNO Naval History Essay Contest, which was about le uh, lessons from the Falklands War. Uh, fascinating article. And now you've written a book about questioning aircraft carriers. And I got to ask, because you're stationed at the Pentagon, how do your aviator colleagues, uh, you know, in the five, the five star uh, or, or the uh, five sided building, uh, you know, like in your company these days? Oh, it's uh, been good debate, but uh, no problems within the uh, within the Pentagon. Sir. Yeah, you got to have a thick skin when you work at the Pentagon. Um, so, Jeff, just take a minute and uh, and tell our listeners a bit about your background. Uh, spoiler alert, I'll, uh, I'll just lead with the fact that you're a submarine officer. So take it from there. Great. Uh, so thanks again for having me, Bill. Uh, I'm a 2008 graduate of the Naval Academy, completed tours on three fast attack submarines. So I've deployed to the Western Pacific three times, and last year I deployed to the Atlantic. Very fortunate to get selected for submarine command, and as you talked about, I'm on my shore duty now in the Pentagon. And obviously all these views are mine and uh, not those of the, the U.S. Navy or the government. And uh, what office, where are you working in the Pentagon? Are you a joint side or Navy side? What's, uh, what, uh, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm in uh, Navy side in FMB, so financial management within the Secretariat. Very good. All right. Uh, and I'll point out when you were, and I'll thank you again. I, I mentioned this uh, on the podcast uh, last fall. So it was, I think, October of 2022. Uh, you were XO on the USS John Warner, uh, had just come back from deployment, and your submarine came up to Annapolis and uh, anchored out in the, in the roadstead there, uh, open for tours for midshipmen. And uh, you invited a bunch of us from the Naval Institute to come out. So I was, uh, that was an awesome opportunity. I had not been on board a Virginia class submarine before, so that was great. Uh, it was really cool to have a VIP tour, courtesy of the XO. It was a pretty impressive, impressive submarine. And now that, that boat's in the yards now, going through uh, kind of a midlife overhaul sort of thing, right? Uh, yes, yep, and it was a great uh, end of our operational time as we got back from the point to go up to the academy and bring a large number of midshipmen on, and then uh, obviously the Naval Institute staff, and then, uh, before the ship went to Norfolk Naval Shipyard for uh, important availability. Awesome. Uh, so, Jeff, in, in 2017, you wrote a proceedings article about aircraft carriers. It was titled Too Big to Sink, which was a riff on the 2008 financial crisis and the big U.S. banks that the Treasury Department deemed too big to fail. So uh, was that article kind of the seed corn for this book? Uh, I think it was. So as we talked about, Bill, in, in 2008, in the 2008 financial crisis, there were certain companies that were just so massive and so important and so entwined in the U.S. economy that the U.S. government deemed them too big to fail, that their, their bankruptcy would be catastrophic for the rest of the economy. So the government took extraordinary and unprecedented steps to protect those companies to, to keep them afloat. Today, I believe the large nuclear-powered aircraft carrier is too big to sink. 
when it can operate as intended is obviously a very capable, very powerful platform. However, uh, carriers are so crucial to the Navy's many missions that if the enemy is able to deter them or damage them or destroy one, I think the results would be catastrophic for the Navy and for the nation. The loss of 10% of our destroyers or 10% of our submarines would obviously be exceedingly painful, but I would argue would not fundamentally change the, the structure or the power of the US Navy. But the loss of 10% of our carriers, a single ship of $12 billion, 5,000 people, and the symbol of US might, that would send shockwaves around the world. And so, because it is, uh, I believe, too big to sink, uh, there are massive unintended consequences for the rest of the fleet structure and how we use the fleet. The Navy has to devote huge financial and operational resources to the defense of the carrier. Um, but I do not believe that we'll ever be able to generate the perfect defense needed for a priceless ship. And furthermore, all those resources focused on the defense are not focused on attacking effectively first, which uh, the Late Captain Wayne Hughes showed is the, the key to naval warfare. So, uh, in, in the proceedings in our in our uh, strategic plan for the Naval Institute, we have this thing called the Dare Factor, which is where we want people uh, to be able to publish ideas that will uh, sort of shake people to think uh, really uh, long and hard about uh, key issues that face the sea services. And so, your book opens with something that hit me as as the dare factor. So can I ask you to just read the opening paragraph of the book, page one, uh, and then uh, we'll go from there. Sure. The US Navy has the most powerful fleet in all naval history. The large nuclear powered aircraft carrier is the most powerful surface warship in that fleet and in all naval history. The US Navy should stop building them immediately. The US Navy should stop building them immediately. Bold, and bold understand scene. immediately in shipbuilding is measured in years or decades. Uh, but uh, so really my thinking is Bill, that for, for 70 years, the U.S. Navy has structured the fleet around the aircraft carrier, right? And it is obviously performed admirably from Korea to Vietnam to what the ship is doing in the Middle East right now. It is repeatedly proven itself to be a flexible and powerful ship. And like all ships, it has flaws and they are growing, but they are not new. Um, and for 70 years, we accepted the flaws of, a, of the carrier-centric model because there was no better option. I don't think that's true anymore. Today, I think there's some key opportunities in fleet design that would let us uh, move beyond the carrier-centric model and develop an even more impressive fleet than the one that we already have. I think the advent of missiles means that instead of uh, the era's premier weapon being restricted to just large capital ships, every single ship, submarine, aircraft, and even trucks uh, can to use the era's premier weapon. I think modern opportunity or modern technology in terms of uh, scouting communications allows us to share more information faster than ever before. And taken together, uh, we have the opportunity to diversify our fleet's kill chains like we've never seen throughout naval history. And obviously, the Navy has known about these opportunities for many, many years. Right? It's, I do not uh, suddenly discover them or anything like that. And the Navy has made great progress advancing uh, those opportunities. Uh, but I believe there's limits to what we can change and what we can improve while we're using the, the same types of ships, the same force structure, executing the same rough types of kill chains. We will have incremental improvements, but we will not be able to achieve true fundamental improvement while maintaining the same overall carrier-centric model. So I wrote this book to sort of examine some of those opportunities and see what fleet we could uh, improve, what fleet we could build if we're able to move past the carrier-centric model. So uh, last week, last Thursday, uh, I saw you at Defense Forum Washington, and uh, we didn't have a chance to chat there, but we both watched uh, Ron O'Rourke's presentation on fleet design. And Ron is uh, um, he, he's really a, a Yoda-like character in that when Ron O'Rourke speaks, you know, people in the Navy listen uh, because he's been following uh, naval issues, force structure issues, shipbuilding programming and budgeting for the Congressional Budget Office for decades. And, uh, and he really knows what he's talking about. Um, and and I, I had to wonder um, if you had talked to him at all or read uh, some of what he's written over the years um, when you wrote this book, because I see similarities in it 
uh, with the fleet design that you call the flex fleet. Um, there's there's resonance uh, between your book and and some of the things that Ron was talking about last week about uh, about fleet design and um, uh, you know particularly you know how do you get the most bang for the buck for the sort of the next incremental dollars that the United States gets to spend on its navy. So uh, at the macro level, uh, d describe that flex fleet as you uh, write in your book. Sure. Uh, so I have not had the opportunity to meet Mr. O'Rourke, but uh, I have read a lot of his work and cited him throughout uh, the book. And so, uh, and then, like you talked about, his point about holistic fleet design really resonated at me, with me when he, when he made that point at Defense Forum Washington. Throughout its history, uh, many people have defended the carrier by arguing that despite its flaws, there is no ship that can match its capability, its flexibility, its firepower. I agree, there is not. Uh, but I think that's the wrong metric and that we should be striving to maximize the fleet's capability and firepower and uh, overall, overall capacity and not those of a, a single ship. And so uh, that is why I propose this hypothetical flex fleet, right? And that, that is not intended to be a perfect blueprint for the Navy, uh, something that we just print off and start building, but it is intended to show that it is technologically, operationally, and financially possible to develop a fleet that outperforms today's already impressive carrier-centric model. So as you talked about in chapter two, I outlined this hypothetical fleet uh, called the Flex Fleet, and uh, to show that we can move past a carrier-centric model with even that there that is now possible. Cool. Uh, your your flex fleet includes four new classes of ships. Uh, so the steel class corvettes, constellation class frigates, which the navy is building now, brass class missile arsenal ships, and bronze class light carriers. Uh, so talk about each one of those a little bit and how they're different from. Uh, the, the current force structure planning or shipbuilding construction uh, proj uh, program for the Navy? Sure. Um, the, the Corvettes are their direct descendants of the Sea Lance and uh, Street Fighter ships. And they're designed to be small, inexpensive, and focus on the use of their anti ship cruise missiles. So they can focus on missions such as uh, peacetime presence operations or in wartime combat reconnaissance or anti surface warfare. Uh, as you talked about the Constellation class frigates, I don't change the design of them at all, but I do increase the, the number of frigates that uh, we have built in the Flex Fleet construct. And we do that to get more ships into the fleet and more missiles, uh, improve our missile inventory. And so the Constellation class could focus on mi missions such as anti-surface warfare and anti-submarine warfare. There is the Arsenal ship, which is a simple, inexpensive, few uh, simple sensors, but a large missile inventory. Obviously, again, they're direct descendants of the missile arsenal ships uh, proposed in the 1990s, but this version has fewer missiles uh, to make them less expensive and avoid some of the problems of centralizing a great deal of power onto a single ship. It does, in your thinking about the, the missile arsenal ships, do those have to be stealthy, low freeboard kind of things? Or are we talking, because you know, in the pages of proceedings the last couple of years, a number of authors have said, you know, uh, we, we could buy uh, existing merchant ships, uh, large hulls, and, and just load them up with containerized missiles or VLS tubes or whatever you want to, but, but really, you know, pack a lot of weapons on a relatively inexpensive platform. Uh, going back to what uh, CNO Greenert wrote in Proceedings, I think it was 2012, you know, payloads over platforms. Um, so I'll just I'll dig, dig a little deeper, if you would, on that missile arsenal ship, what it looks like. Because I know in the 1990s, if I remember right, you know, that idea was, you know, a, a very stealthy, low freeboard kind of, uh, you know, almost it was a bit of Zumwalt class ish. Um, but, the, you know, that we know where that design went. So what, what are you thinking in terms of an arsenal ship? Yeah, I, I focused on uh, numbers and simplicity to keep the cost reasonable. So I'm not trying to make another battleship, some nuclear powered uh, uh, ship with hundreds and hundreds of missiles, right? So something simple and like uh, Dr. Hams, I think, has written for proceedings and others, right? Take a missile hull or take a merchant hull and put lots of missiles on it. 
I mean, maybe you can balance it down to reduce its radar cross-section, but again, only if financially feasible. Gotcha. And uh, I think an argument against that often is that it's not survivable, right? It uh, doesn't have all sorts of defensive systems. And, you know, it could have some defensive systems, but it's, its purpose is not to be uh, indestructible, right? Its purpose is to be cheap and have a small crew and offer a lot of missiles to the fight. And if we, we don't want to lose it, but if we do lose it, it will not cripple the, the fleet overall. And yeah. so that and that missile yeah. inventory, right? You can tailor it to early in the war. Maybe it's a lot of uh, anti-ship cruise missiles, and as the war goes on, you know, you shift that inventory to more land attack options. Got it. And and notably, not manned by a thousand or five thousand, you know, uh, American sailors, right? Yeah. Sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, bronze class light carriers. Yep. So this is essentially a modified uh, America class light carrier. Light carrier. So. Its intent is to better distribute naval aviation, focus naval aviation on missions it can perform better than any other community or any other platform, such as sea control or fleet air defense, and then reduce the impact if and when we lose one of those ships. So, but I do want to make clear, uh, a light carrier, a CVL, will never compare with a CVN. A CVN is obviously going to be more capable. And if all we do is take the money from the four class and instead build slightly more or increased numbers of light carriers, again, that will not result in a, in a stronger fleet. What I'm proposing is a shift in the entire fleet structure, and I think that would uh, generate a more powerful option than what we have today. Uh, so what what happens, you know, we we've currently have uh, roughly 11 carriers. Uh, we're building up to four Ford class. and. We've got the the Nimitz class carriers. Some of them are, you know, the Nimitz. I think itself is getting to be uh, over 50 years old now, or roughly 50 years old. So, uh, in your plan, uh, as you said, you know, we we don't change uh, the composition of a fleet overnight. It takes it takes time. So, what happens with the early early Burke class DDGs and the Nimitz class CVNs uh, over time in in your flex fleet? Sure. Uh, so in the flex fleet, the large nuclear powered aircraft carriers, right, they remain key parts of the, the fleet for years and decades to come. So I use them for the, the remainder of their surface lives. And obviously they're going to be important parts of that fleet for many, many years. I just think now is the time to stop building them and start that transition. And as far as Ollie Burks, again, they are very, very capable warships. Um, but to shift the fleets away from a sort of all capital ship contract, the flex fleet continues building Arleigh Burks and the follow on DDGs. It just builds uh, fewer of them to free up resources to, to invest in different platforms. And I would also note that uh, the flex fleet also cancels plans to build the conventionally armed Columbia class SSGN. So in the flex fleet contract, there is a, a large increase in the number of missile cells that we would have. And so that reduces the need for Columbia class SSGNs. Right. They are very, very capable ships and very capable at uh, land attack. But if we had a much larger inventory of missiles in the surface fleet, then that would make the Columbia class SSGN also a very expensive way to deliver those missiles. Got it. Got it. So the uh, the Ohio class SSGNs, uh, starting with the Ohio and I think Florida is in there, uh, uh, Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yep, I those are the oldest uh, or just among the oldest of the Ohio class submarines. And they're getting, you know, towards the end of their service life. Right. And now as the Navy builds the Columbia class SSBNs, there's also a discussion about uh, at some point building Columbia class SSGNs. And your, your point is that this flex fleet would say would would obviate the need for that. You wouldn't have to have what are very expensive platforms, nuclear powered submarines with, you know, highly uh, trained technicians to run them and man them equipment. Um, uh, and, and so you're putting more missiles on surface ships and less missiles uh, in the submarine force. So you, you don't need that capability. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I mean, the, the Ohio class SSG, SSGN is essentially a, a very, very capable arsenal ship. It, is, it, it can get where it needs to go and then deliver a large number of missiles when it gets there. And so the Columbia SSGN will obviously be very, very good at that. Um, but if we had large numbers of surface arsenal ships, which would be much cheaper, not as survivable, but uh, we'd have large numbers of them, I think you can, that could offset the need to, to buy the very expensive submarine platform. So again, shift 
uh, shift the fleet away from sort of the all capital ship construct. Yeah, and uh, as uh, as Cap retired Captain Bill Toady, who was at Defense Forum Washington last week, and he wrote in uh, his article in the December issue about submarines and uh, in the uh, War of 2026 scenario, he pointed out that the um, the SSGNs, so the Ohio class SSGNs, uh, would be forced to shoot their missiles you know, a, a long way away from the the Taiwan, the, the, the contested weapons engagement zone uh, of Chinese missiles. Because once you start firing off uh, TLAMs from a, from a submarine, you, you've kind of given away where you are, uh, or you've given away, you, you've, you've made your location known if there's adversary ability to detect those launches. So uh, yeah, it's a, that's an interesting point. Uh, so, Jeff, I, I got to ask this. Uh, you're a submarine officer. Some of our listeners, all of Ward Carroll's YouTube audience, I'm sure, uh, will will cast a jaundiced eye on a submariner who wants to get rid of carriers and yet, you know, largely leave uh, submarine shipbuilding plans unchanged. You know, just respond to that. Sure. I understand. Uh, I understand that. And that's valid. But uh, I'm not trying to push some parochial product that just takes money from the four class and uh, devotes it to submarines. And I'm not arguing that we need to get rid of naval aviation. It is obviously going to be a key part in any sort of China fight. I'm arguing that there's certain missions that naval aviation is very, very good at. And there's certain missions that other platforms and other weapons are probably better suited for. And because of that, we can shift our fleet structure to better align all the communities, all the platforms to focus on missions that they can do best and thus maximize the fleet's overall capabilities and readiness for for great power competition and or combat. Uh, Navy has a, obviously a long history encouraging debate. And uh, you talked about at the beginning of the show about the response of naval aviators. Well, every naval aviator I've talked to about this has uh, engaged in great debate. And there's never been any sort of personal attacks or any problems or anyone telling me that I'm, uh, you know, shouldn't be doing this or anything like that, or that I can't uh, join that debate as a submariner. And I think that's a great credit to naval aviators to the Navy and to the Naval Institute that we have a culture that encourages that sort of debate. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, one of the quotes that I loved in your book, and it's uh, on page 209, um, and this is a, a proceedings quote from uh, 1958, an uh, article by Rear uh, Admiral Gallantin. And at that time, the discussion was about whether uh, nuclear weapons had sort of um, made surface ships uh, kind of obsolete. And, and he wrote, uh, vulnerability of surface craft to atomic bombing does not necessarily mean that they have become obsolete. What determines the obsolescence of a weapon, and this is the, the key point for me, what determines the obsolete, obsolescence of a weapon is not the fact that it can be destroyed, but th that it can be replaced by another weapon that performs its functions more effectively. And, and it, that just struck me as, you know, if I had to distill your book down to kind of one key point, I think that's the point you're trying to make is that, uh, you know, it's we've had aircraft carriers as the center of the battle fleet for 70 odd years now. Um, and they're not obsolete necessarily because they're vulnerable now, but they're becoming obsolete because there are other ways to have the effects that the Navy needs to have for less money and at less risk. That, am I getting that right? Am I, am I boiling it down? No, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he, I would say he was, that, that Admiral was quoting Admiral Nimitz, but yeah, I mean, that is. Oh, okay. That was a, that was a, a quote yeah. from Gallantin of Nimitz. Yep. Makes it even uh, more, even that is actually, boring. yep, sums it up, Bill. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the book, you, you've got some great tables in the book uh, that compare the flex fleet to the current Navy shipbuilding plan. Um, it, just in a couple minutes time, can you describe some of those big differences when you're, where you're pulling the levers and, you know, a little more of this and more of that? And so what are um, some ca capabilities that the flex fleet brings that the current, fle current fleet design really doesn't bring? Sure. Um, in general terms, I'm trying to build a fleet, a hypothetical fleet that better um, capitalize on some of those opportunities that we talked about. So first and most importantly, I believe that we need to embrace the age of the missile, right? Throughout naval history, there's been a close relationship between the era's premier weapon and the large capital ship that could carry it, only due to physics. 
So only large uh, ships of the line like HMS Victory could physically carry dozens of cannon. And only large battleships like USS Missouri could physically carry 16-inch guns. And today, only large carriers like USS Ford can physically carry and launch E-2s and dozens of F-35s. Missile changes that relationship and allows, um, instead of fleets with only about 15 or 20% of the ships carrying that era's premier weapon, now every single ship in the fleet including submarines and aircraft and small support vessels and even trucks can carry the air's premier weapon, the missile. And those those missiles are relatively inexpensive, easy to operate. Uh, they don't require local air or maritime superiority and you can launch large numbers of them without the associated human or financial risk of a, a manned platform. Um, they have a huge payoff if they are successful and little downside if you fail with them. And they are very difficult to defend against because the attacker has physics and numbers and time on their side. And then I also examined um, how networks allow us to, modern communications really allow us to network that distribute fleet and share information faster than ever before. And that together that allows us to diversify the fleet's kill chains like, uh, like we've never seen. So that that taken together, I think that's a big opportunity for the Navy. And what I'm trying to convey with this hypothetical flex fleet that is that now we can uh, have a fleet with more platforms, launching more weapons from more vectors and more domains, and thus greatly increasing our ability to uh, to complete the kill chain to defend it. To, uh, sorry, to destroy the enemy. Yet again, right? The Navy has known about these opportunities and has made great progress uh, thinking about how to implement them and developing those technologies. But I don't think we can fully capitalize on their potential while remaining within the confines of the carrier-centric model, and that any improvements we have will be incremental and not fundamental. Gotcha, all right. Uh, so the last chapter of your book is a scenario uh, centered around a conflict in the Senkaku Islands in uh, 2028. Uh, and the USS Gerald R. Ford carrier features prominently in that scenario. Uh, I don't want you to give away the ending, uh, but why did you pick that scenario? And, and, and maybe talk about some of your, you have uh, some green, yellow, and red zones, weapons engagement zones, or danger areas that you talk about uh, in the book, and, and they play into this scenario a bit as well. Sure. I was just trying to demonstrate some of the themes in the book through fiction. And so for the scenario, um, I picked one to mirror the Falklands War, the, the one example of conventional naval combat in the last 70 years. So both the Falklands and the Senkakus are small islands with little conventional appeal, but obviously massive political and strategic value. Um, both those sets of islands are very close to one, uh, the aggressor. So whether that's Argentina or China, and very far from the other, uh, the opposing force, Britain or the United States. And so in the scenario, the Ford and its strike group, right, they perform admirably, they do well, and they probably win their battle tactically. However, Ford suffers damage, and so it's out for the remainder of the war, and we lose all of its impressive capabilities. I think more importantly, um, when video of Ford coming into port with, uh, with that damage, when that video is streamed across the world and shows up on newspapers, uh, the political and diplomatic impact is, is much larger than any, any sort of tactical su successes that Ford had. So, and in, the war, uh, in that scenario, I also try to use it to examine the importance of scouting and missiles and how who can be found first can be shot first. So, what you talked about, Bill, sort of simplified into green, yellow, red zones of green is uh, where we have complete, I would say, sea control and we, we can see what is going on there. Yellow is uh, the contested region and then red is really only where stealth uh, platforms, whether that's aviation or submarines or cyber uh, attacks, where, where they are the only survival assets. Gotcha. All right. Um, so I'm I'm curious uh, because we've been talking a lot about the War of 2026 scenario, which is uh, for the American Sea Power Project. Um, that is the the setup, if you will, for our uh, phase three of the project. 
in the December uh, issue of the magazine. And then we have articles on submarine warfare, surface warfare, mine strike warfare, et cetera, and, and more coming in January. Um, so did, did, did you have a chance to read those and, and did they reinforce any of the ideas in your book? Uh, yeah, so that was a great issue. And I, I really enjoyed being able to hear some of the authors talk about a defense forum in Washington. Um, like we talked about before, I know the changes I'm recommending would take years and decades. And so it's not like we're about to see the flex fleet driving around in 2026. Um, but the article, it all comes down to sea control really resonated with me and how uh, I think it's two surface warfare officers talked about the importance of improving the surface fleet's lethality and range, about how platforms today are, their sensors and their weapons are more important than the ship itself. And I really like the line um, about how offense wins battles and defense prolongs defeat. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that uh, applies to my work here that uh, if we believe our Navy's primary focus going forward is gonna be peacetime presence operations and permissive power projection, that would be a very reasonable conclusion, right? It is what we've done for 70 years, is what the aircraft carrier has done well throughout that time, and it's what we're doing right now in the Middle East. Um, there is no ship that's going to match, you know, Nimitz or four class carriers in permissive power projection. However, if we think that we need to be ready for sea control against the peer adversary, and if we need to be able to project power from contested seas, then I think there's better options to do that than so centralizing most of the fleet's firepower in 11 ships. Well stated. Yeah. Uh, certainly ideas that merit a lot of examination and uh, and more thought. Um, so, uh, Jeff, we're about out of time. Uh, any saved rounds or, or questions that I should have asked? Nope. No, there's always. Thanks, Bill. All right. Well, I hope that you'll uh, keep writing for us. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm impressed that a, an active duty uh, officer, submariner, um, is able to not just write for proceedings and win some of our essay contests, but also pump out a really thought-provoking book. That, uh, that, that's, that's amazing. So um, my guest today has been Commander Jeff Vandenagel, United States Navy. His book is titled Questioning the Carrier. It's available now from the Naval Institute Press. Whether you agree or disagree, I can say it is well-written, it is methodically researched, and it is very logically argued. And if you're interested in the topic of fleet design and what the Navy of the future should look like, I definitely recommend it. Jeff, thanks for your time today. Thanks and congrats on the book. Thanks, Bill. And uh, since we didn't beat Army, let me just say, go Navy, beat China. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it, was a, it was a tough game up at Foxborough. Uh, fortunately, the weather held off. Uh, so Saturday was a good day for the game. And then Sunday, I was talking to a midshipman yesterday about the redeploy option from uh, Foxborough, Massachusetts. And he said, about half or maybe two thirds of the brigade of midshipmen had self-deployed up there. The upper class in there, you know, got to drive their own cars, and uh, uh, and that was the the day on Sunday coming back. That you know, it was almost monsoon kind of weather with you know four or five inches of rain hitting Massachusetts and Connecticut and New York. And uh, he said, despite that, I guess everyone uh, in the brigade, except a, a couple of people you know, we're a bit delayed by uh, traffic and weather and that sort of thing, but we're able to call in. So the redeployment went well. Uh, second half of the game, you know, Navy came alive, but not quite enough to uh, uh, to take the game. But it was a, it was a good, good game, especially uh, watching that second half. So uh, I agree, though. Go Navy, beat Army, beat China. Uh, let's do this thing. So uh, thanks again. Thanks, Bill. All right. So today's episode was brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute who have supported the open forum for those who dare to read, think, speak, and write about sea power. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.